I, I was granted control of this test antenna for just a little bit this morning. So that's why we're doing it now and not on Sunday. We've been working on this series of antenna controllers, which I've talked to you about before for about six years now. And this is the most advanced one we've done. And this is interesting because I have not only the control panel that I'm accessing, but I have a live feed of a camera pointing at the antenna. This antenna is a, I think, 13 or 14 meter antenna. It's a full motion antenna. It can swing all the way over in elevation from one side to the other, and it can swing all the way around almost 360 degrees in asthma. Um, over here on the control panel, you can see that we're following the satellite called AMC1 right now <clears throat> in monopulse mode. Uh, and what monopulse means is that we are actually tracking a beacon signal that is originating from the satellite on the receive side. This antenna both transmits and receives. So it has both uplink and downlink. And on the receive side, there is basically a wavefront sensor that determines the error from how far we off and how far we are off in both X and Y from the center of the beam signal. And it in real time applies corrections fed back to the motor control with proportional control of the motors to very smoothly and continuously stay locked on to the center of the signal. And it's it's uh, it's pretty accurate. So just to show you how we get there, I'm gonna select a different target. Oh, am I? Oops, hold on, I have to be in the right window to do that. Stand by. I'll select a different target. We're currently pointing at AMC1, and I know that AMC3 is visible to me. So I'll select that one and say track. This is just a control panel. This isn't the actual user interface, although it looks pretty. <laughs> the user interface is a much more elaborate uh, control that runs on a separate computer and it's all networked together to this. This is actually directly connected to a Swiftworth program that's doing all of the control. So when I say track, it confirms with me, do you want to go over here to 187, 175.8 degrees and 46 in elevation? And I say yes. And if you watch the live feed, you should see it actually go there. Boom. This is a fast antenna. And when you think of how big that is, it's really impressive. This thing can move at just over three degrees per second in both, both azimuth and elevation. So it's making all those position changes. The, the, the two columns, azimuth and elevation, are showing you the actual measured position from some encoders. We're using optical encoders. <clears throat> of the azimuth and elevation axes, and then pole one and pole two are the polarization of the center for the feed. Wow. And those are typically orthogonal to each other. It's almost there. The pole are little teeny tiny little motors, so it takes an awfully long time. And they're geared up pretty high. It takes a long time to get there. And then you can see the received signal level with that little sort of uh, green bar showing you and you saw the signal come up as we moved in on it but why is it not acquired if it's so green already it's not because it's the uh we're waiting for all of all four axes to be within the ah. dead band the dead band on the polarization axes is 0.1 degree the del the dead band on as and l is 0 0.001 degrees so hundred mm. of a degree this was crazy fast. Are there special motors for moving fast and moving precise? They are really big, big motors. There are two motors on each of the axes, azimuth and elevation, so that we cancel out backlash and always have a very, very smooth motion. There's a special PLC that is dedicated to each of those just for the motor control. There we go. So the next mm -hmm. phase in acquisition is to do some peaking. So it's going to go. Uh, up a little, down a little, and figure out where this, approximately where the center of the beam is. Then it's going to go to the right a little and to the left a little and peak up the azimuth axis. Then it's going to calibrate some error vectors so it knows how to uh, follow the signal, and then it will begin following. But uh, from which point on can you interface with the satellite? 
do I have to wait for the whole accusation or can I just say, ah, okay, it's oh, now? A, it's, it's close enough now that they could actually be mm -hmm. doing live, but they won't go live in a real system. They won't go live until it says following. Oh, okay. And they'll be monitoring that. Uh, we provided an SNMP interface uh, over the network. So their uh, monitoring control system that's controlling their RF amplifiers can just uh, query the system status over SNMP. And then as soon as it says that it's locked and acquired, locked is for the signal, acquired is, there we go, and now we're following mm -hmm. the target. That's pretty cool. Amazing. Yeah. Wow, thank you very Didn't much for easy? sharing. Didn't yeah. it? And it only took six years. Yeah. <laughs> wow. A couple other little things if you just want to see them. In the various setup screens, we have all the things you need to know. For example, where are we? <laughs> um, a few options that are local to the site specific. What kind of receiver are we using? What are its characteristics? How are the encoders set up? Because the encoders need offsets. We have a thing called the wizard that actually calibrates the antenna. It runs it in uh, full motion, limit to limit, and determines where all the physical limits are and what the backlash is and various things like that. The gear ratio, which you have to know. Um, what are the physical limits of motion so we know where we can and can't point. Uh, a few characteristics about how to control the motors. What are our positioner dead bands and some timing. So all those things are stored in a, in a database for use by this control application. Mm -hmm. And there you are. So this is what I've been doing, I don't know, to 14 hours a day for the last few years. And do you enjoy oh. it? Hmm? Do you still enjoy doing it? it? It looks fun. Oh, it's really fun because every time we finish one thing, there's like a whole new feature set that wants that they want to do. And the other fun part for me is that there's a whole bunch of processors in this system all running for it. Mm -hmm. um, this thing is running on a Windows thin client, and that's performing the main control function. That's in Swift for it obviously, since it has a GUI on it. And then all of the real-time control that's done way out at the antenna, uh, at the, there's a control panel uh, in, inside the building to the left. Those are all a bunch of little ARM processors all running our Swift XR. Mm -hmm. So all in all, I guess we have probably about a dozen processors in the system all running forth, performing different aspects of the control and monitoring. and. Uh, some user interfaces with push buttons and displays on them and so on. And all of them are networked together uh, uh, via Ethernet with a, with a private switch. So <laughs> can you now also make this a product and, and make multiple antennas or is it already in use for multiple antennas? Oh, it's already, yeah, no, that's already happening. Yeah, mm -hmm. This is the first instance, this was a test site. The second instance just shipped last week and it will be installed and tested. And then after that, it will be replicated all over the world. Mm -hmm. There'll Very probably cool. be a few thousand of these before they're done. Right. A few thousand. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, yeah. There are so many Earth stations. Oh, I have the coordinates for this if you want to see it. Where can I put that? Uh, you could just show it us on Google Maps, maybe? In, you have a browser open, don't you? I have it on Google Maps. I have the actual link so that you can pop it up and see a Google Earth view mm -hmm. of this Earth station with a red pin on top of this antenna. Where should mm -hmm. I put that? Uh, I think you should just open a browser and open it and just share that window instead of the current one, because that way we don't have to. Oh, sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. I do. Okay. Uh, and how do I switch to share that one instead of the one I'm sharing now? Just click the, the, the icon again and select a different screen or just stop sharing. Yeah. No. Whoa. Oh, Philip has a question in the meantime. Can you take questions while you're doing this? Yeah, I just clicked that thing and I'm seeing conclusion static checking. That, that's 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 thing. just normal because there's nothing uploaded. You okay. just need to click the slides now and okay. then please uh, select another window. Sure, it's going to be the same window because I have to just hop over to a different. There, can you see that? Mm, not now. Not yet. Maybe you have to click accept first somewhere. Uh -huh. Yeah, that looks Some better. Coming up. There we go. Can you see it? Uh, yes, and can you zoom out yeah. a bit so that you understand where it is? I'm sorry, I'm just, uh, I clicked over to the tab with the... Uh, 
Google Earth view. Do you not see that? We, we see it, yes. Slightly to the north of New York. North of New York. Okay, thank you. Yes, it is. It's northwest of New York. It's the northwest corner of the state of New Jersey in Sussex County. It's up on a mountain. It's This is in the Vernon Ski Area. Uh, and this site has been here since, I don't know, the 1970s or something. And can you see mm -hmm. the red pin? That's the actual antenna that we were just looking at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you look in the town square in Mattermost, there's a link to the Google. Yeah, I pasted the link there. Mm -hmm. uh, just Correct. above this, the next dot over was one of the first antennas we ever instrumented, and it's up on a tall tower. And to get up to that antenna, you have to go up exactly 84 steps inside of a metal tube. <laughs> and we did that hundreds of times. Boy, were our legs sore. Any other questions? If not, I'm... Yes, Philip has a question. Please go ahead. Yes. Um, so, so how precise uh, does the sort of pre-known position? Do you have to know the pre-known position of the of the satellite to actually catch the beam? Yes, uh, you do. And actually, we have a, a real-time access to two-line element sets, the NORAD data, and we use that to the ephemeris data to calculate the initial the current position of where the antenna should be. And you, there's actually a tracking mode that we support that will just continuously follow the antenna using those two, the calculations from those two-line element sets. So I just run those calculations continuously and follow it. So you can do that to just point blindly at something, and you'll be very, very close to it. So we do that to get our initial position, and then we peak up by moving around a little bit, capturing the signal, and then lock in on the signal. Uh, Philip, and maybe I want to point you to that. There's a very long talk by, not a very long talk, but a very good talk by Leon, where he explicitly explains how to parse the two line elements and how the controller mm -hmm. works. Not to not to keep you from asking questions, just so you know in, in the back of your head. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, please, Philip. I, 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 I was, I'm just curious, sort of how much how much error can uh, can the, um, the the tracking have um, for it to 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 find the. To find the, the, the oh, how close do you have to be? Yeah, exactly. Hmm. A degree or? Oh no 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 no! Much less than a, than a okay. degree. You need to be within probably point point two to point five degrees. Got it. In each axis, and you'll catch the edge of the signal. But the other thing that you have to be careful of is that you're really catching the main beam and not one of the side lobes. Because if you catch a side lobe of the beam, you know if you look at the the beam pattern you'll see like a big peak and then you'll see two little lobes on the side I see. and you want to avoid <laughs> those so we set a threshold so that we're, we're saying if it's less than about 10 db down don't believe it mm -hmm. <laughs> okay anton please go ahead uh, yes so um why do these satellites need such big um, um, uh, antennas on the on the ground uh, the typically for gain yes. on, on the receive side for gain and on the transmit side just to focus the beam to transmit so they they don't have um, very good um, um, very strong um, senders uh, I don't know how, how much power they're actually sending oh, yeah Okay. It's in the kilowatts. The, the power oh. amplifiers aren't very big. They just fit in a rack. I've no, I mean, the, 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 oh, the, the satellites. satellites. Oh, the satellites themselves have very weak signals. Yes. Yeah. Milliwatts, yeah. probably. Yeah, milliwatts. Correct. Yeah. I mean, the signal level that we were seeing in there, can I go back to that one? I'm sorry about all these, this cascade here. this signal level just below the bar if you see the the green mm -hmm. bar showing you and that's db relative to some zero point the actual power level that we're measuring there is minus 48.0 dbm so yeah that's just microwatts mm -hmm. the typical antenna sizes that we are controlling are on the small size six meters and the largest one we've done so far is 30 meters. Yes. <laughs> Guys, this is such a... Those ears. 
What? This is such a classic fourth application. I think we all should unmute and say <laughs> thank you to Leon there. No, it's not. I ran it. I ran into Chuck somewhere, and he said, "What are you working on?" And I told him this, and I was. It was our very first test antenna. It was a nine meter antenna, and he laughed. He said, "Oh my God, you've come full circle. The very first thing <laughs> I ever did was a nine meter radio telescope." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Leon.